Good morning. If I can ask everyone to please find their seats. I know we're going to have some folks coming in uh, a little late, but I want to take advantage of uh, the limited time that we have and, and think this is a wonderful opportunity to hear from uh, a country that uh, has done an awful lot in the space that all of us are, are looking at, uh, whether it's de-radicalization efforts, um, whether it's um, uh, a, a, whole, whole, a whole host of factors that uh, I think the Dutch uh, provide uh, learning opportunities for the rest of us. And I know the United States has benefited greatly from, uh, from some of those efforts. Uh, for those who are new, um, uh, the idea of these sessions is to shed more light than heat. We try to, to look uh, uh, beyond the headlines to, to, to get a better understanding of, of the various uh, efforts that countries are are dealing with and how we can deal with the transnational threats to some extent with transnational solutions. Uh, I believe this is the 41st in our series. Um, I think we've covered uh, all the continents except for uh, Antarctica, so we'll see if, uh, not sure they have too much of a, uh, of a threat in their hands, but, um, uh, but we're absolutely delighted to have uh, Ambassador Jones Foss with us today. She's got a, a distinguished career as a diplomat and as a civil servant and no stranger to universities. She served on various boards of universities, including a medical center. But uh, the ambassador um, was sworn in, I believe, uh, 2008. Is that correct? That's right. So yep. A little more than a year on the job. Uh, an exciting time, I think, to be in Washington to see all the changes uh, occur here. But she's also served uh, in various postings in, in Washington in the past, in the Prague, um, in Dhaka, and, uh, and most recently before becoming ambassador to the United States, she was uh, the Director General at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So um, we have someone here who's not only a, a, a career civil servant diplomat, but a real expert. And we're delighted, uh, Madam Ambassador, that you're able to join us. The idea is maybe 20, 25 minutes yep. uh, um, uh, overview, and then the idea, as you all know, is to engage in a dialogue. So, uh, Madam Ambassador, thank you again, and uh, I'm delighted to have you. Thank you so much, thank Frank. You. Well, I really appreciate all of you coming here to listen a little bit to us about our experiences in the Netherlands. It's a great uh, honor indeed. And um, I have to say, uh, the expert qualification, uh, I'd be a little bit uh, hesitant about myself. I have worked in foreign relations and foreign affairs for a long time. Also served in Moscow uh, in the old Cold War days. I was ambassador at large for human rights. I was head of our security uh, council task force. So I did a, a variation of jobs, but counterterrorism and radicalization is a very specialized field. So I'm sure you all know a lot more about it than I do. But I'm very happy and thrilled indeed to share some of our experiences uh, on this very important topic. And particularly, uh, happy because uh, it also is all about our core values. It's about values such as freedom of speech, freedom of religion, uh, open-mindedness and entrepreneurial spirit. And I think it's these values that the United States and the Netherlands uh, share and have shared uh, for now uh, 400 years. And before I start on my talk, I thought I'd just like to remind you of the fact that it's uh, exactly 400 years ago this year, it was 1609, when the first Dutch settlers arrived in New Amsterdam, uh, the island of Manahatta. Uh, they set up a settlement called New Amsterdam, and it became New Netherlands, uh, the settlement of New Netherlands. And in that settlement, 16 languages were spoken. Uh, women were allowed to have property, which was most unusual in those days. And certainly, I think in the English uh, settlements, that was not the case. I, my husband is British, so you can imagine we have long debates about that. And um, it was, it, of course, in 17th century terms, a place where, uh, where there were freedoms, where citizens could petition the States General in Amsterdam if they thought their rights uh, were affected. So, you know, I think we share those values and we have worked for those values. We defend them also. The Dutch are in uh, Afghanistan as we speak in the difficult southern part. We have almost 2,000 troops there, and we stand there shoulder to shoulder with our American friends and allies to defend the freedoms uh, that we so strongly believe in. So having said that, by way of introduction, I would like to share some experiences with you uh, about the way in which the Dutch government is trying to counter radicalization processes. 
And although radical thought and behavior are present in various groups, uh, ranging from the far right to the far left, not to forget the animal rights uh, movement that at times was very strong in the Netherlands as well, the topic of today that we'd like to focus on today is the very sensitive issue of threat of radicalization in the Muslim communities in the Netherlands. Let me first take you back to when the Dutch were first confronted with this radicalization. After the horrifying attacks on September 11, we quickly realized that this was not only something that could happen in the United States, it is also something that could happen in a country like the Netherlands. And that message was driven home to us by a minor uh, but still serious incident, the death of two young Dutch Muslims in Kashmir in January 2002. And you mentioned that Liedewey Ongring was here, our former deputy uh, um, uh, counterterrorism uh, coordinator. And I know she mentioned that as well as something that, you know, really drove home the message uh, to the Dutch public. Dutch intelligence and security service was soon able to report that both men had been recruited for the violent jihad by Islamist militants in their hometown of Eindhoven. And Eindhoven is generally a peaceful town in the south of the Netherlands, more known for Philips. It's the home base of Philips where all the light bulbs come from. And it's also a very popular town to, f to celebrate Carnival, a three-day uh, series of festivities where people <coughs> don't sleep and go from one pub to the other dressed up in funny clothes. But anyway, that's more what we knew Eindhoven for. So people were shocked to learn that uh, terrorists uh, could be living among us. And at the same time, there was a tendency to downplay the problem, the risk that these young radicals could bring the jihad to Western Europe, or let alone to the Netherlands, was considered to be minimal. So it was a kind of wake-up call, but there was still the idea, hmm, well, this can't happen in our country. But then came November 2, 2004. A Dutch filmmaker <coughs> with a well-known last name, and I'm sure you probably all read about him, Theo van Gogh, van Gogh uh, was brutally murdered whilst bicycling through the streets of Amsterdam. Uh, <coughs> the assassin was called Mohamed Bouyeri, Mohamed B, for a long time in the Dutch press, young man of Moroccan descent who had grown up in Amsterdam, seemed fully integrated, well educated, um, but he was part of a network of young Dutch jihadists who had fallen under the sway of a Salafist from Syria, who in a home-based religious school prepared young people psychologically for violent jihad. And the Dutch intelligence and security services were aware of these meetings and had dubbed the participants the Hofstad group. The Hofstad means the court city. It's, it's the Hague, it's the, the city where the, the queen lives. And that was the operation's code name. In both cases, Eindhoven and Amsterdam, we were dealing with young people raised in the Netherlands, hence the epitaph homegrown radicals. They attended schools there, they were well educated, and although they appeared to be fully integrated in the Netherlands, they still became radicalized in the Netherlands. And the murder of Theo van Gogh, I can tell you, left a tremendous impact uh, on the Netherlands. First of all, that something like that could happen, and that it could happen in broad daylight in Amsterdam, somebody who was cycling to his work uh, and the brutal way in which uh, this, this murder was carried out. <coughs> Maybe a few words on Muslim uh, immigration to the Netherlands to give you some of the context. Um, Netherlands uh, in the 1960s, up to the 1960s, was basically a country of mainly Dutch-born uh, people. We have had some immigration over the centuries, but usually of small groups of people who were persecuted. So think of the Huguenots from France, uh, people from Antwerp after the fall of Antwerp, uh, Jewish uh, people who were prosecuted in their own country. So we were a country to a certain, a certain extent of immigration, but very small scale and very speci specific group. We were not an immigration country like, for example, the United States is an immigration country. And then in the, in the course of the 60s, um, people from mainly Morocco and Turkey um, uh, came to the Netherlands to work as low-skilled labor because we had a growing economy, there was not enough low-skilled labor, and they were, were called guest workers. And the idea was that they would go back to their countries of origin, they would work for a few years, and that would be the end of that. But of course, people, once they come and work in your country, they come and stay. And not only did they stay, they married, their children came over, 
their aunts and uncles, their grandmothers. There was a whole stream of family reun reunification. And the children of the first immigrants often went back to the home country to marry people from Morocco and Turkey. So we had a large uh, influx of, uh, of people from Turkey and Morocco. Today there are about, well, slightly less than a million Dutch Muslims. So you've gone in a fairly short period of time from almost 0% to now about 6% of the population. Another uh, uh, trend that contributed to this was that we had in the 90s, 80s and 90s, a very open and tolerant uh, asylum policy. Uh, so many people from Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, Somalia came to the Netherlands to ask for political asylum, were granted political asylum, so formed uh, a big group. But mainly, I think, with the Moroccan and Turkish Muslims, um, um, uh, they, the reason for, for some of the problems that, that uh, evolved was the lack of education, cultural differences, and serious problems they faced after they arrived. People were often illiterate. They came from the poorer parts of Morocco and Turkey, Berber communities, Anatolian highlands, and they often could not read and write. The women often stayed at home and did not participate in Dutch society. These problems continue today, especially in the Moroccan community which includes a disproportionate number of people with social economic problems, involvement in crime, and social misbehavior, and not surprisingly, a disproportionate number also of young radicals. These problems are fed into an increasingly polarized public debate on integration of Muslims, particularly the Moroccan Muslims. For those of you who maybe follow this sharp debate that's taking place in the Netherlands right now, one would be inclined to believe that we are speaking of hugely different population groups with different identities and values. But recent sociological research, however, shows that the opposite is the case. Also, these Muslim immigrants and their descendants are increasingly integrated into Dutch society, participating in ed education and the labor markets, and sharing the same personal, social, and political values increasingly as uh, the people who originally lived in the Netherlands did. But we need to make sure that these positive developments are not threatened by the polarized debate that's taking place in Dutch society. If so, the ensuing lack of trust and sense of belonging among Muslim youngsters could again accelerate the radicalization process. So now a few words about uh, the Dutch approach. How does the Dutch government try to come to terms with these serious phenomena? First of all, we try to analyze and tackle the dangers of radicalization and terrorism in a coherent way. We have developed a comprehensive policy approach that includes repressive measures against terrorists, which are reflected in the new Crimes of Terrorism Act, but puts an equal emphasis on prevention. And let me start with the latter. What do we do to try and prevent radicalization? We have three main strengths in this approach. One is stimulating social cohesion and integration. The second is making vulnerable groups more resilient to resist radicalization. And the third strand is active intervention to identify, isolate, and contain radicalization processes. All relevant government agencies work closely together in a combined so-called action plan on polarization and radicalization, which is coordinated by the Ministry of the Interior, that's our Homeland Security Ministry. Partners on the national level include the National Coordinator for Counterterrorism, the Ministries of Education, Youth and Family, the Foreign Office, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, as well as operational services like the Dutch Intelligence and Security Service, the police force and the public prosecution service, and of course the local authorities. The action of local authorities is crucial. They are most familiar with their own Muslim communities and can take the most appropriate measures to prevent, observe and intervene in processes of radicalization. Central government is supporting local authorities whenever necessary, for example by co-financing plans of actions, by facilitating the work in the field of professionals such as police officers, social workers, youth workers and teachers. There is a national information center, an advice center called Nuanza, that has been opened to provide tailor-made 
expertise and guidelines to all the different services. So how do we go about stimulating social cohesion and integration? Our starting point in working to prevent radicalization is to intensify our efforts to integrate Muslim citizens into Dutch society. We are trying to make Muslims feel more included, mainly by, making, by paying more attention to the identity issues confronting young Muslims in a Western environment, by combating discrimination and exclusion, and by encouraging Muslims to participate in society and in politics. The recent appointment of Ahmed Abu Taleb, um, who used to be in the uh, municipality of Amsterdam, then was a deputy minister in the national government, and he has now been appointed the mayor of the city of Rotterdam, one of the biggest port cities in the world, I think is a very important step. And he's a very good example, a role model also to Moroccan youth in the Netherlands. Uh, also one of the uh, ministers at the moment in the Dutch government, deputy minister for immigration issues, is um, a, a, a young Turkish uh, woman, woman of Turkish uh, descent, um, Nebahat al Bayrak, and I think also she does a very good job in showing that uh, <coughs> the Muslim Dutch citizens do play an active role in society and in politics, and they are an example, I think, to their communities. So we've also seen a steep increase in the number of successful Dutch entrepreneurs of Muslim background, but this emancipation process still needs much more work in terms of education, integration in the workplace, etc. We are also trying to counter polarization and Islamophobia by encouraging interfaith dialogue and inter-ethnic contact. Many local initiatives targeting young people and their parents are already underway. And we also feel very strongly that integration and social cohesion is enhanced when Dutch Muslim communities have their own training programs for Imams, so they are no longer dependent on Imams being imported from other countries. What happened originally when we had our new Turkish Dutch and Moroccan Dutch communities is that the Imams came from Turkey and Morocco. They didn't speak the Dutch language, uh, so they couldn't also help their Dutch, um, Moroccan and Turkish citizens with the problems they faced in the Netherlands society because they didn't speak the language, they didn't know the societies. So we think it's very important that we now have our own training programs for Imams and uh, in, in that way uh, these clerics are better informed about life in the Netherlands and in the West and are better able to guide young people finding answers to their questions in life that they have. The second strand of our work to prevent radicalization is that of strengthening social resistance to radicalization and terrorism, especially within the Muslim communities. We believe that we can only solve the problem with the help of Dutch Muslim communities. Let's not forget that they are the ones who suffer the most, in general, from radicalization and terrorism. They are the ones who risk losing children to extremism or are faced with prejudice or racism. And they are all too often viewed as collectively responsible for the acts of individual extremists. And at the same time, Muslims themselves are best able to recognize and resist the dangers of Islamic fundamentalism, jihadism, and terrorism at an early stage. And that is why we attach great importance to communicating effectively with our Muslim Dutch communities. And another crucial aspect of this is to provide a sufficient range of information. If young Dutch Muslims search the internet for answers to big questions of life that they are searching for, and you Google general terms like Islam, Quran, or mosque, you are very likely to end up on radical sites. And we discovered that more moderate information is very scarce. So we're trying to increase the diversity of information available about Islam by supporting institutions that voice more moderate views and pass on factual information about the religion, challenging ideas with ideas. We also put emphasis on publicizing the importance of fundamental human rights. So this strengthening of social resistance to radicalization is also a key element in the Dutch government's response to the parliamentarian Geert Wilde's short film about the Quran, which you undoubtedly have heard about here as well, Fitna an Arabic word meaning tribulation, if, I, if I've been informed correctly, which was released, it's now already two years ago. 
And in order to avert the kind of unrest we saw with the Danish cartoon controversy, we made a deliberate effort to reach out to representatives from the Muslim community in the Netherlands, but also in other countries through our embassies. And um, I will get back to, to, to this later on, say a few more, more words about it. So the third and final strand in our approach is identifying, isolating, and containing processes of radicalization. We want to stop radicalization before it leads to violence. This means that frontline workers within the police force, schools, youth and family service, need to be able to detect signals that individuals may be isolating themselves or even turning against society. Now, we know this is very hard to do, but it's still important to try to keep on focusing on this and then take action. And key elements of this intervention strategy are local professional interdisciplinary case analysis, person-specific <coughs> intervention, including de-radicalization coaching by religious key figures, disturbing hotbeds of radicalization, preventing radicalization in prisons, it's also a very vulnerable uh, area, and combating use of the internet for radical purposes. And then last but certainly not less important part of our comprehensive approach that I've tried to sketch for you is repression. Our laws have been amended to introduce harsher penalties, ban recruitment, freeze assets, and so on. Dutch police and criminal justice authorities have been given new powers, allowing them to investigate and make arrests at an earlier stage. Intelligence and security services have received more staff and greater funding, and their information can now be used in court by the public prosecution service. What have our experiences thus far been? Of course, it's very difficult to make results visible, and certainly if you, you know, what we hope to do, you prevent something, it's always very hard to show or to prove that you have prevented something. But, so the mere fact that there have been no serious uh, terrorist incidents in the Netherlands recently does not tell us very much. We don't know whether this is a result of our policy or whether other factors have been at work. What is clear, though, is that there anxiety about terrorism and terrorist attacks has significantly, significantly decreased, falling from 29% in 2006 to 12% in 2007 to 8% in 2008. Secondly, we are gaining experience with the new Crimes of Terrorism Act, which was used in the first instance, instance to convict the Hofstadt group that I mentioned earlier on. In one of the first cases, however, the Court of Appeal held that Contrary to the original court's trial verdict, there was insufficient evidence of terrorist organization or of crimes of terrorism. So the Public Prosecution Service will now lodge an appeal to the Dutch Supreme Court. Thirdly, we have gained greater insight into processes of radicalization and we have seen the growth of a strong network of government agencies that now work together to combat terrorism and radicalization. Also, there are signs of increased resilience against violent extreme extremism within the Muslim communities. This became apparent from the calm reaction of Muslim organizations and key figures after the showing of Geert Wilders' film Fitna, and from the many constructive initiatives that followed this. Another more recent example is the network erected by young Moroccan professionals to counter the trends of dropout and crime in their own communities from within. So we are seeing new developments. Some are cause for optimism, others for concern. There is hope, for example, in the fact that Salafists mitigated their tone of voice. The speeches in the Salafist centers are no longer discriminatory and don't contain hatred against other groups. There is no call for violence or support for jihad, as far as we've been able to track. Even in March 2008, when the before-mentioned move movie Fitna was released, the Salafists called for restraint and advocated only the use of legal means to fight the release of the movie. It has resulted in the indictment of the maker of the movie, the parliamentarian Geert Wilders. Although causal relations are hard to establish, 
the Dutch government believes that this development is at least partially caused by um, our counter-radicalization policy that I just <coughs> described above. Also appears that the Salafist movement has stopped growing in the Netherlands. Even some orthodox Muslims turn their heads away from the Salafists because of the very demanding lifestyle and their very dogmatic approach. Meanwhile, through scientific studies, we know more about the Salafists than we did several years ago. Many Dutch Salafists adjust the orthodox lifestyle to their needs. Some of them speak very good Dutch and are socially and economically active in Dutch society. Of course, the Dutch government does not intervene in people's religion. It only becomes a government matter when orthodoxy leads to discrimination, the spread of hatred or violence. Luckily, this counts only for a very small group of Salafists, of radical Salafists. But of course, this is not to, sa to say that we don't have to stay very, very alert. There's also some good news about jihadist movement in the Netherlands. The jihadist networks are relatively weak at the moment and not well organized. They lack leadership and there seems to be no current intention to commit a terrorist attack in the Netherlands. On the internet we see young Muslims who verbally attack the jihadists by stressing why the jihadist interpretation of the Islam is wrong in their eyes. And we're also seeing greater resistance to radicalism among Muslim groups. But again, we have to stay alert and nothing can be taken for granted. We still see Dutch youngsters who travel to jihadist war zones for training or to participate in battle. In July 2009, so very recently, in Kenya, four young men from The Hague were arrested based on the suspicion of having the intention of going to Somalia to engage in terrorist activity. Later they were released, but they continue to be suspects in uh, an ongoing investigation. In neighboring countries, we have seen a rise in radical and terrorist activity. In the past year, an attack was averted in Germany and new attacks in Spain were prevented. These attacks were prepared outside Europe. While there is currently no direct threat against the Netherlands, we clearly need to be alert. The danger is always out there and can manifest itself at the most unexpected times and places, as, as you well know. A serious point of concern is the growing polarization in Dutch society. Many citizens have lost their faith in the traditional political parties. Right-wing oriented populists who speak out against Islam get growing support in the political opinion polls. We also see a rise in activities of other extremist organizations, right-wing extremists, animal rights extremists and left-wing extremists. A very small percentage of them are willing to use violence as a means to achieve their goals. So far they don't advocate violence against individuals, but their actions can be very intimidating. And uh, there are examples like vandalizing property or, or other incidents. So a few uh, remarks in conclusion. I think the essence of the Dutch approach is comprehensiveness in conjunction with an emphasis on prevention. We stimulate communities to create better understanding and better relationships. We advocate a policy in which all communities in our society have equal opportunities with regard to housing, education and work. And we fight discrimination of individuals or groups of people. If in individual cases all these preventive measures don't work, we try to identify processes of radicalization as early as possible and counter them with strategic interventions. And the last stage is repression. But if necessary, repression has to be swift and vigilant. In short, we consider the relevant communities as our partners. We invest <coughs> heavily in prevention, but when push comes to shove, the Dutch government is able and willing to use all the legal means of repression at its disposal to swiftly stop radicals. Due to the international dimensions and connections, real and virtual, all Western countries are at risk today from homegrown and transnational forms of terrorism and radicalization. And one of our greatest challenges is to hold radicalism and jihadism while at the same time protecting our constitutional values and our constitutional rights that I started with, the freedom of speech, the freedom of religion. We have to reassure the vast majority of moderate Muslims who live in our societies that they can practice their religion freely and in a country that accepts them as full citizens. They are uh, 
just like us, they are our own Dutch Muslim citizens with all the rights and opportunities that all citizens in our nation enjoy, but at the same time also with all the obligations that all citizens have to contribute to the well-being and prosperity and safety of the modern societies, the complex societies that we live in today. So thank you for giving me the time for telling you a little bit about the Dutch experience and approach. And I'll be happy to uh, engage in any questions and conversation. Yeah, and so is Peter Stort, who sat next to me. Peter is our police attaché, um, who worked as a police commissioner in Amsterdam and has been very closely involved with these issu issues as well. So thank you for your time and attention. Madam Ambassador, thank you for a very comprehensive uh, um, discussion. And also, I, I think that the U.S. was perhaps a little slow to pick up on some of the soft instruments that should be part of any solution set, but, but clearly are front and center stage right now. So I think that uh, the Dutch experiences and approaches have, uh, have, have been ahead of their time. We call them Paul Revere approaches uh, in the United States, and I think uh, uh, many other European countries have also benefited from, uh, from your experiences, what worked and perhaps what didn't. So. Uh, It'd be great to do an analogy vis-a-vis -vis the, the way the Danes handled the cartoons yeah. and the way Fitna yeah. uh, was handled by not only the Dutch government, but ultimately society writ large, because yeah. obviously very different outcomes, yeah. um, similar to with the way the Swedes handled the cartoon uh, crisis afterwards. Uh, I'm going to open it up to, mm. to, to questions here, but I'll, I'll uh, take advantage of perhaps asking the first question. One is a little broad and then one is a little more narrowly focused. Broadly speaking, um, I think one of the most uh, um, interesting aspects that the Dutch have recognized that many of the solutions reside outside of government altogether. I mean, it's providing the good that government can, uh, can offer or provide any citizen. Um, not in a unique or, or different kind of way, whether it's jobs, whether it's opportunities, whether it's engaging in the political process. But ultimately, many of these solutions are societal, and uh, they're going to have to be borne out at the very local levels. Um, um, and, and as much, if, you, if there's more you can share there, perhaps, uh, I, I think that would be beneficial, because I know the UK is mirroring very similar programs with uh, whether it's their street program or whether it's um, educating uh, the Islamic scholars and clerics to, to not only be able to, to be fluent in English but also to, to have a sense of society. So I'd be curious what lessons, good, bad, uh, we can all uh, learn from that. And then more tactically speaking, you made a statement in there that uh, you have uh, young Muslims engaging in the uh, chat rooms and on the internet, pushing back on the violent jihadist narrative. I, I think that is absolutely critical. I'd be curious if you've provided some legal opportunities for these young men, because for them to have credibility, they're going to be on sites that, quite honestly, are probably monitored by everyone, mm. not just uh, the authorities. If you uh, provided some uh, runway for them to be able to do that in a legal uh, kind of way in the United States, that's a difficult issue. You, you've got a number of um, Muslim Americans who'd like to engage in those dialogues, but I think they're concerned about going into those chat rooms mm. because it may bring about the tension that they're not ready to, to, to deal with. Mm. And then finally, we have a special guest here to some extent, uh, Noman Benotman, who uh, I think is um, uh, the only one who has met with uh, Osama bin Laden, Zawahiri, in this room, um, and many others. And uh, I'd be curious about your own experiences, Noman, if you can, because I think it marries up very well with some of what we've heard here today. So. Madam Ambassador and Peter, you might want to uh, jump in on the legal provision because I wasn't aware you had that authority. I knew you were looking at that, but um, I'd be curious what thoughts. Okay, maybe to start with the communities. I think when, when we had the first um, waves of immigration, we very much took the position everybody should do what they want to do in their own communities, right? A, a, a tolerance. Uh, that was almost a form of indifference, uh, a tolerance that sounds very positive if you uh, first think about it, but in retrospect was not the right form of tolerance. 
And I think what we've learned through our own experience is that you have to engage. You can't just let people be and do what they want to do and say, oh, well, we close the door and then that's their own business. Because when they close the door, the things that happen behind the door can be very damaging to society as a whole. And uh, that, that when, for example, uh, was relevant for the position of women, the first generation of uh, spouses, wives that came in, as I said, often couldn't read or write, stayed behind closed doors, and we let it be because we thought, well, if that is what they want to do, that you know, we should uh, respect that and, and tolerate that. And I think the difficulty is to find a balance between respect for other cultures and other religions, but also respect for basic rights like uh, the right to participate in society, the right to education, the right to health care, the right to the people couldn't speak the language. So if they went to hospital or to the doctor, they couldn't communicate. And we solved that by getting interpreters for all the different languages, instead of saying, well, it's better that you learn Dutch so you can communicate in your own society. And I think that's what then led to uh, the, the engagement of the local communities um, uh, in cities like Amsterdam, like Rotterdam, like The Hague. Uh, but that's taken us a long time, and I would have thought the first lesson uh, we should have started that much earlier. There was debate in the 80s and 90s about what was going on in society, but it was not politically correct to discuss that in the political domain. It was not discussed in Parliament. And I was just telling Peter on the way here, when uh, my husband first came to the Netherlands in the <coughs> early 90s, uh, he often <coughs> he worked for the Dutch Institute of International Relations and used to take groups to, uh, to, to, to NATO, to the EU, etc. <coughs> And in the evening, he would often have a beer with the bus driver. And he said, talking to those bus drivers, who were often, you know, white Dutch guys who lived in the suburbs of Amsterdam or The Hague, he said, this is a totally different Dutch reality than I hear in Parliament or in the, in the media. You know, people are dissatisfied, they're unhappy, they don't understand what's happening in their communities, the, 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 the fabric of their society is changing so quickly, and it doesn't seem to be reflected in the political debate. So I think that's a lesson we learned, and that uh, uh, I think we took that on much more in this century, so starting 2000, 2001, uh, through neighborhood initiatives, through involving the uh, Moroccan communities, through a set st a dialogue with Muslim organizations, both at the national level and at the uh, city level, uh, through educational initiatives, the, the health centers where people come with their babies, you know, discussing issues about um, uh, children and health issues of children, educational issues. So it's a much more proactive approach that we take now. And slowly but gradually, it seems to be uh, paying off some results. You see especially Moroccan girls, for example, doing much better at school, uh, going more and more into university, so higher education as well getting positions in government and in, um, in, in, uh, in, in national organizations, local organizations. So it's a growth process. It's not something that you can change from one day to the next by saying we now have a new policy so the problems are solved. I think it will be a, a, a refining of a balance in our cities and in our societies in which we come to a more inclusive idea of citizenship. I might note, I actually visited one of the schools. It wasn't gymnasium, it mm -hmm. was underneath. And you actually had teachers uh, coming up with indicators that they were trying yeah. to address to, yeah. to know when to intervene yeah. and have a conversation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know if that was nationwide or if that was a pilot program, yeah. but I know Rotterdam and, yeah. Uh, yeah. and Amsterdam, I believe. Yeah. It is so. more important in the big cities because Rotterdam and Amsterdam have, you know, 20, 25% of the population are uh, uh, Muslim communities, immigrants, so the problem is much stronger there than it is in other parts of the Netherlands. But so it's, it's, it's building up communities, it's building up education, it's building up employment opportunities. In the past, they're often, you know, even if people had had an education, it would be hard to find a job because you didn't have the networks. If your family is from the Netherlands, you have an uncle who works in a in a business or a company, that's a way into internships, etc. But 
for the new immigrants it's harder to, to get into the workplace, so there are programs to get people internships and into the workplace. And slowly but gradually, I think these are uh, taking off. Peter, do you want to say something about the Yeah, maybe I can add, add a few things. Um, uh, first of all, about myself, so that you know who you're talking to. I'm a police attaché now. I'm a police commissioner, and my last assignment was uh, the western part of Amsterdam, where I was a district commander. And that's the area where we have a very large uh, Moroccan and also Turkish uh, community, and where Mohamed Bouyeri and uh, Samir Azouz and, and others uh, grew up. So, so my experience is especially on the, on the street, uh, street level. Um, I gave you um, this operational action plan on polariza polar polarization and radicalization. And in this, um, well, you, you will find a wide range of, of activities and initiatives that the that government undertakes right now. And it's, it's, um, it's a three-level approach. The first level is the local level, because we very firmly believe that um, you know, if you want to be effective, um, you have to uh, be effective on the local level. The second is the national level, and the third is the international level. So we have a very strong cooperation with uh, the UK, with Denmark, um, uh, internationally within the EU, we are working on, on a benchmark, you know, to to look at the several programs that are uh, uh, working in the EU, and especially to look what is what is effective and what's work, what works. Um, um, yeah, and, and, and I <coughs> I invite you to, to look at all those activities. You know, we, we have you know training programs, especially for the professionals, the police officers, the the schools, the, the youth uh, workers. Um, but a lot of activities are aimed at the Moroccan community itself, um, and and we do see more and more Moroccans, you know, stand up, you know, take responsibility and and um, and try to make their community more resilient uh, against radicalization and. Our impression is that you know the combination of activities that it works, but of course it's always very uh, hard to say that you know because now we say it works and tomorrow we have an attack. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I that's always, always very hard. But but <laughs> what what uh, I think our own politicians have had trouble with that one. Yes, mm. defining success by disproving yeah. double negatives is yeah. hard. Yeah, that, that's hard. Um, so. I think the most important message is that, that we're very active on all these fields. And you know, to give you one uh, thing that, that is problematic, we started several um, uh, training and ed education uh, programs for imams. You know, because um, preferably we want imams, um, you know, to uh, to grow up in the Netherlands and to study in the Netherlands. You know, so that they can teach um, whatever they want. Because of course there is complete religious freedom, but you know, in, in the Dutch setting, in the Dutch uh, context. Um, and, and that, we're still, we're working on that, but it's, it's still difficult because in the traditional um, the community, you know, used to imams, you know, they're always relatively older, you know, and they have a whole history going through their faith. And um, so in the uh, Muslim community, people say, yeah, now here's somebody in Holland does a study and then right away he's imam, you know, how, how can that be? So. Um, so, so well, it, it, it's an ongoing, uh, on, ongoing, uh, going uh, process. Um, what you asked about the chat rooms and the, the legal framework, um, I'm, I'm not aware that there is um, a legal framework. Um, but um, you know, we, we are very active on the in internet, both the uh, national coordinator on counterterrorism and as the police. Um, but of course, when the police is active on the internet, you know, then um, it, it has a different you know, that something is, 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 is going on. Um, I just might underscore, though, from a policy standpoint, you want people with the cultural, obviously linguistic, but also who are true scholars, Islamic scholars, yes. to be able to engage in that. Not so much law enforcement in the traditional yeah, sense. Yeah, so yeah. if you are enabling that, I applaud that. But yeah. it's, a, it's a difficult it's a difficult legal set it of is, issues. It is, and, and that is what we do, and um, uh, especially one part of the district where I used to work, Slow to Vaart, um, is uh, we have um, a Moroccan um, yeah, city count councillor. Well, it, it's in the, the city is divided in, in several municipal areas, and, and he is the head of one of those areas, and he is from Moroccan descent. He's a former police officer, by the way. But he's, he's very, very active, and he hired a few anti-radicalization experts. 
um, you know, who very actively you know, reach out to, uh, to mosques, to the community, um, sometimes also intervene. Um, so we have an, an intervention program that if people think you know, they see the things of radicalization or they think that specific kid is you know, starting to radicalize and they show their concern, you know, then we try to, um, yeah, to create uh, a tailor-made approach to that person. Um, you know, to pull them out of that radicalization process. Process, but you know, uh, of course, it's a very, very uh, sensitive topic. You know, because how far can you go as the government? Uh, that's also the question with um, you know expressing views or interpretations of Islam. Yeah. You know, I mean, how far can you go as a, as a government, mm -hmm. and at the same time keeping uh, complete religious uh, freedom? So it, it it's always. Uh, uh, balance, I think that, uh, that, that really Peter, can I ask for a point of clarification, mm -hmm. and Madam Ambassador, if you want to uh, jump into this. Most of what I have seen in the European context, and, and I'm trying to remember what I'd learned in uh, the Netherlands in particular, but the mosques themselves are normally not the problem. Maybe for mm -hmm. talent spotting, Hmm. They identify, then they bring um, elsewhere because most the uh, clerics and scholars, um, uh, they're, they have some communication with uh, the authorities at the local level at the very least. That may have been a problem five years ago. That's, is that still a challenge today or do, do you look at some credentialing, for example, in prisons? Um, where religious providers and, and uh, clerics all go through some sort of credentialing process. Is that something the Dutch are considering? Um, in, in general, it, it's not, not an issue anymore. It, it, it used to be. We had a few um, uh, Islamist leader, you know, uh, you know, very... Or actually, uh, North, the, not even Moroccan, if I recall. They were largely yeah, right. southern yeah, yeah, yeah. Somali. You know, and they really gave you know, speeches um, that, that don't fit in a democratic uh, society. Um, but that's, that's basically the, the past. Um, um, of course, we do stay in close contact with a Salafist mosque because sometimes you know, people meet each other there and then leave the mosque, as you know, and then you know, come together and then the radicalization process uh, continues outside uh, the mosque. So, um, I would say that the mosques Talents themselves, yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah. I'd be interested to hear. Noman, uh, yeah. your thoughts yeah. in the UK yeah. and, and you might want to give two minutes mm -hmm. on uh, your fascinating background. And mm -hmm. I first met Noman a couple years ago. Um, there's a short paper we've uh, handed out uh, based on a, a long interview with Noman, and, and uh, I found him to be uh, a scholar and a strategist. So I, I think you come from a perspective that many of us can only think about. 